my life is a long history of narcissism and narcissistic people. Um, the last 25 years, especially, uh, have been the worst, have, have brought me to a place in my life where I sold my home, gave up everything, and I'm living in this little studio apartment. It took for my nose and rib to be broken and to be literally um, left outside hiding in the woods by a tree for 17 hours while my abuser hid my car after he beat me in the garage. No one knew where I was. And it was 17 hours later that I heard a, 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 a person, a friend of mine, her voice, um, she went to my door, I was watching her dog and she hadn't heard from me and knew something was wrong. She stopped and I heard her having a conversation. These were the words, the woods by my home at the time. And I heard her having a conversation with him, like, where's Susie? And he's like, oh, whatever, you know, always a smear campaign. And I was bleeding, I was bruised, I was hurt, I was in shock. I didn't move for 17 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran, I heard her voice, it took every ounce of strength in me to run towards her voice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I just got up and ran and I dove mm -hmm. through her window. Oh. The, the window of her car was open and she just looked at me because my eye was all swollen and badly black and blue and just said, what the F happened to you? She, could, she had no words, she was in shock and he looked at me and he's like, I didn't do that to you. He just started screaming. Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, she get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. And I'm shaking. And I just said, go. I just started screaming, go. I just wanted out of there. So while we were there, um, my phone was on the side of the road because I had pulled up in my, in my car. And he had come over to the, having an argument. I wasn't staying there. It was always an argument. I'd always have to leave my home. So this was one of those times and I had pulled up in front of my home and he was outside putting the garbage pails out and kind of stopped me. So I stopped the car and he came over to the driver's side, opened the door, pulled me out and just started beating me. Wow. By the grace of God, I was able to hit the record button on my phone and I got about 45 mm -hmm. seconds of him beating me. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have the recording, I don't know what would have happened because after he saw me and after I dove through that window of the car and she took off with me trying to take me to the hospital, but I never reported anything he did to me. I never went to the hospital. I kept everything a secret. I covered it up. I never told the police. I took the blame for everything. He started screaming. I didn't do that to you. So as we were driving down the road to the hospital, she, which I didn't go into, I made her take me to her home. He was on his way to the police station. And he went into the police station and said that I, I guess he saw me and I beat myself up and I did it to myself and I was gonna blame him. I was, I have a long history in my childhood of all kinds of abuse, which I now understand is why I attracted this type of person or tolerated this kind of horrible behavior. And, over the years when I would be beaten up, I would go because she lived in the woods in a log cabin and I would go hide out for a couple days after the beatings. And she put me upstairs in the bed and she got a phone call and she's like, Susie, it's the police department. I guess it came up on her, her phone. And she's like, we were confused. I was just shaking. I couldn't speak when these events would happen. These abuse, I don't know what you call them, cycles that he would uh, put me through. I would just shake, shut down, stare at the wall, regroup. He would pretend nothing happened and we'd carry on like usual. Mm -hmm. There was a knock at the door because she didn't pick up the phone and it was two police officers. So they asked if I was there. She said, yes. She explained what happened, how she found me. They came up to the bedroom, bedroom upstairs, and I was laying in the bed. I couldn't speak. I still couldn't speak. And she's like, this is nothing new. This isn't the first rodeo. I, she's for all these years, this is what happens. I just, you're not gonna, she's not gonna talk. I know Susie, I just let her ride it out. So they looked at me and they, they were questioning me, like, did I do this to myself? And the woman whose home I was in said, wait a minute, I have her phone. Cause in the car I had said, I hit the button. I don't know if I record anything. I didn't know anything. 
So mm -hmm. my phone was dead. It was broken. A uh, police officer plugged it in, they charged it. And on that phone was him beating me, screaming, I'll call the effing police and tell them I beat you in the driveway as he was beating me. And at the end of the 45 seconds or whatever it was, was the horn because I was screaming for help as he dragged mm -hmm. me out of the car. So my story, the timeline all coincided with her, her story and me saying he beat me up. So they called an ambulance immediately. I uh, said, everything has changed. This, we, uh, it, a younger officer with an older officer. And he says, I'm literally in shock were his words. He says, I cannot believe this is the same man that walked into the police state. I'm getting goosebumps an hour before. Um, I, I can't believe it's the same person. And he was the first one. So the, we're with the ambulance. They, I, I knew any of this because I never went through, I never told the truth. I, I was always, you know, abused and shut my mouth. And he went through the list of, do you feel safe? Does this happen? Does that happen? And, and all, he says, you need the women's center. You need a support group. He says, we're taking you to the hospital, but I am calling the support group. Cause I, he's like, you need to call them. And I'm looking at him like, I'm not calling anyone so the ambulance takes me he calls um in danbury here in connecticut the center um the support group for women um and domestic violence sexual assault they, they cover everything and i went to the hospital and they did x-rays cat scans he broke my nose he broke my rib mm. Wow. The police, I'll never forget the police officer standing there and he's like, I called for you because I know you're not going to call and they're going to be get, getting in touch with you from the center. You need help. And the ER doctor who I've known over the years, like if the kids needed stitches or something, you know, I've seen her before. And she's like, Susie, please, you cannot allow this to continue, please. Mm -hmm. I said, how many times this happened? And I, I remember so many, you can't remember. So they let me go um, home back to her house and um, they went and arrested him. We had to wait, he had to wait for his warrant. They had to, you know, order his warrant. Um, he actually <laughs> took his shaving kit. They called him and said, <laughs> you need to turn yourself in. He took his shaving kit and his cigars to turn wow. himself in. Spent the night in jail, I guess, was there in the morning and had to find a way home. No joke. You know, he, he's a farmer. He, he schmooze anyone and make it look like my fault. And I would always be the quiet one and just take the blame. And he was Mr. Prince Charming. And so this time it was different. The women's center called me a few days later and I started therapy with one of the women there. He, I, he, we had an order of protection. I had an order of protection. I got a phone call from a mutual friend at, uh, in the neighborhood and they said, look, can you come over? Ronnie wants to talk to you. So here we go with the love bombing and mm -hmm. I'm sick to my stomach. And the only thing that makes me better when I'm abused or hurt or, you know, discarded and all the things he's done to me for the last 25 years was him at, at least acknowledging me. Right. Mm -hmm. So now he wants to see me. Even though my bones are broken, my eye was mm. black. Um, I went and met him. I went and met him and he got on the passenger side of the car and he promised me the world getting mm. the whole mm. future faking. We're going away. Mm. We're going on vacation. We're doing this. I'm doing mm -hmm. that. I'm sorry. Never again. Um, I promise you. I, I can't believe I did this to you. You name it. And, and this is a man that literally gets on his knees every night, reads the Bible and prays. And wow. it was so confusing to me because I, I believe in God and it was always so confusing to me how someone could do that. Everything was confusing. Uh, my, I couldn't Absolutely. think straight. I couldn't feel straight. I, I was a, a shell of who I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I let him come back in the house water protection and all and he literally hung a sheet over the bedroom window so no one could see the lights he would have to get up um to go downstairs or whatever in the middle of the night or you know he never slept with me he'd always sleep in the den you know that was one of his things he'd ignore me unless he needed something or wanted something 
I was ignored. I was, you know, the silent treatment. So he was watching movies with me and, you know, he'd get up and go get us ice cream or whatever and take a flashlight in the middle of the night in case the police passed because I did live on a main road, but set back. Um, he went to his court date. Now this was 2020. So it was the beginning of COVID. The court system was shut completely down. Um, fortunately, because of that, everything was so backed up. Mm -hmm. I did not want to, I knew I didn't want to, you know, drop the charges. I filed for divorce. I was ready. I was like, I cannot live like this again. My, my dear old, he's now almost 12, 12. He was nine at the time. My, my nine year old grandson saw me with the black eye mm -hmm. and from, and other family members and my, my sons couldn't mm -hmm. even look at me, couldn't even look at me. Um, now I understand like how painful it was for everyone in my family to see me suffer, pretend mm -hmm. it was okay.